Employment Roundtable podcast is produced by the Gable Gottwalls Law Firm. The Employment Roundtable is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not contain legal advice or create an attorney-client relationship. The information provided should not be taken as an indication of future legal results. Any information provided should not be acted upon without consulting legal counsel. Welcome to the Employment Roundtable, where we provide you with the perspectives and information you need to make wise employment decisions for your employees and your organizations. I'm your host, Talitha Ebright, and today we're talking with Holly Cole, Director of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Oklahoma, and my Gable Gottwell's partners, Ellen Adams and Paula Williams, about the last of our three-part series relating to the intersection between employment and health. This episode focuses on the EEOC's new updates to its COVID-19 technical assistance following the formal declaration that the public health emergency is over. (laughs) Yay! Yay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Holly, how about if you start off by giving us an overview of where this new guidance fits in with all of the other guidance that the commission has issued during the past three years in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. Thanks, Talitha, for for asking me to to talk about this issue. It's it's still relevant. the The pandemic is over, um, but we're we're going to continue to see these legal ramifications, you know, coming from it. For I suspect the end of time. Um, yeah. So so the 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 updated um, guidance on COVID nineteen um, and all the other laws that are enforced by the ADA with the um, by the EEOC, such as the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. Um, it was last updated on May the 15th, and it's now uh, 79 pages long. Uh, so it has a lot of information, and in it. it's very comprehensive. It's located at eeoc.gov. So if you if you uh, want to check that out, it is. We continue to update it periodically. Um, like I said, it was just updated with the most recent information, and so it's um, you know as we learned through the pandemic, it's um, it's an evolving area. You know, we continue to see things that um, not nearly as many charges of discrimination being filed with us as before, um, but it, it's we're still seeing activity. For instance. Um, charges of discrimination based on uh, religious bias claims for vaccine mandates um, drastically increased in 2022. So um, they increased by nearly 20% up from 2021. Uh, So even though um, the employers have had uh, mandates in place for quite some time now, we're going to continue to see people who are um, saying that they need a religious accommodation or perhaps even a, a disabled or disability related accommodation regarding vaccine mandate charges. So uh, we'll we'll continue to see that. That's one of the things that's so exciting about the employment law for me is it it is expansive. It, it it's not static at all. It continues to change. Um, so uh, we we just continue to follow it and and issue whatever guidance that we feel like is going to be helpful to employers and employees. Thanks so much, Holly. And just, you know, I'm curious about that increase and just, I don't know if you have any insight on, you know, what the possible reasons for the increase are, but could it be just that, you know, um, people were trying to get in under the time, like maybe they had claims that, you know, were from 2021, but they were trying to just get in under any applicable timelines for filing their charge or... Yeah, that that could that could definitely be it. Um, people have 300 days from the the date of the discriminatory act or alleged discriminatory act in order to file um, a claim with the EEOC. <clears throat> and so sometimes what you'll see is people wait till the <laughs> the tail end of that 300 days before they come to us and file. And it also could be employers who have recently adopted you know vaccine mandate policies or that they didn't go into effect until a certain time frame. It could be brand new. And employees, you know, who just started there and now they have, they realize that there's a vaccine mandate policy. So several things could be impacting that. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Thanks for that. That's helpful. So now, Paula, last season, we had a long conversation about long COVID. And could you please just remind us what long COVID is, 
what obligations employers continue to have relating to co- long COVID even after the pandemic um, and just sort of where we are with that. Sure. So long COVID is a range of symptoms that can last weeks or even months after uh, someone is first infected with the virus, uh, COVID-19. This can include things like joint or muscle pain, headaches, brain fog, difficulty focusing, difficulty breathing, or even fatigue. So a person with long COVID may have a disability, And if they do, they may need reasonable accommodation to perform their essential job functions. So then that would fall under our ADA protections that we've covered many times. So as a reminder, under those protections, a disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So you can see how long COVID can meet that definition in certain circumstances. So one of the other things we know about a disability is it can't be temporary. So, um, But long COVID can last long enough to qualify as a disability in some instances. Uh, The Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, I was uh, noting this week, has some great information for employers about accommodations that they might consider to specifically address long COVID symptoms. They list every long COVID symptom and then a number of accommodations to consider. So here's a couple of examples. And of course, when the employer is considering these, they need to evaluate um, whether it would create an undue hardship, right? So if an employee is short of breath, maybe the employer needs time to take a break to use a nebulizer. Maybe they're in a position where they could allow some telework um, or just allow more frequent rest breaks. Uh, If an employer has brain fog, this guidance says an employee may need a quiet workspace, may need to use noise canceling headphones, or maybe even need to listen to white noise. Those are small accommodations or rest breaks. And I could give you example accommodations for long COVID for the next hour based on that guidance. So if an employer is navigating this, the Department of Labor has a lot of resources for them. That's great. Super, super helpful. Um, Now, Ellen, what other COVID era obligations uh, do employers need to satisfy at the end, you know, even after the end of the declared public health emergency? Sure. Well, you know, I was sitting here thinking about this discussion and all of the acts that were passed and trying to recall the alphabet soup associated with what we were all trying to figure out and learn and deal with during the pandemic uh, with respect to uh, employees and different leave obligations. And I've blocked it all out. So the acronyms are no longer there. Um, And thankfully, because they're no longer obligations that employers have to uh, follow. So what has extended are those evergreen issues that employers had experience dealing with before the pandemic and that carried through the pandemic, which is FMLA, ADA, accommodations, both for religious issues and also for uh, events that would qualify as a disability under the ADA. So those things that, you know, we, we tested all the boundaries of those, I feel like through the pandemic and applied them in ways that we never expected to, but they were still those laws that we've been dealing with for, for quite a while. And those have, have continued and will continue to apply after for a whole variety of issues. I think one of the instances where you know, I would say has been impacted by the pandemic and something that Paula touched on is mental health. And, you know, in consulting with employers about the issues they face on a daily basis, I hear over and over again how mental health is becoming a a bigger topic in the workplace Um, and how, you know, in a labor market where you're trying to retain your best top talented employees and be aware of all the issues that they're dealing with, mental health is certainly one that has become become an issue and is appropriately addressed under uh, the ADA and potentially the FMLA, depending on the situation. So uh, that's something that I think has changed a little bit as a result of the pandemic. Um, but we're, we're kind of back to the basics, uh, thankfully, and I've forgotten all the others. <laughs> <laughs> the, the good news is that if we ever have another pandemic, 
we've got some uh, a framework. We've got That's we right. know we're going to know how to respond a little bit better. <laughs> Don't even I think. say it. Don't even I, say it. I, we're not going to have another pandemic. I'm knocking not. on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree, though. I agree. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you all so much. This was a really informative um, session, and I, I really liked hearing about the resources available on the Department of Labor's um, site to you know, guide employers through particular accommodations that apply to each of the long COVID symptoms. That was really informative. Um, and thanks to all of you for listening to the Employment Roundtable. Please join us next time as we dig into discrimination pitfalls employers need to consider when incorporating artificial intelligence into their businesses. The Employment Roundtable podcast is produced by the Gable Gottwalls Law Firm. The Employment Roundtable is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not contain legal advice or create an attorney-client relationship. The information provided should not be taken as an indication of future legal results. Any information provided should not be acted upon without consulting legal counsel.